Luke chapter 9. I'm going to begin reading at verse 57. Read down through the end of the chapter, and I'll invite you to stand with me as you're able to in honor of the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. May God add his blessings to this reading of his word. You may be seated. How much does it cost to be a Christian? Can we associate a monetary value on salvation or our faith? Is it possible to to place a dollar figure on the life we have in Christ? The answer, of course, is no. The cost of salvation would be a figure that would be too high for any of us to be able, any of us to be able to pay. See, salvation is not cheap at all. The salvation that you and I enjoy, it was purchased at a great price when the Son of God laid down His life on a hill called Calvary. While it does not cost us a penny to be saved, our salvation cost Jesus his life. It cost God his only son. We're offered the opportunity to accept what Christ did for us as a ransom for our souls and receive salvation fully at no apparent cost. Salvation is free. It's a gift of God's grace. You and I are free to accept it or to reject it. However, we must be careful not to cheapen God's grace. We can't see God's offer of salvation as something that is not costly. Because there is a cost. Not only did Christ give his life, but the cost of serving our Lord is great. I'm not talking about a tax or a tariff for serving the Lord. I'm not talking about our gifts. What I'm talking about is a realistic understanding of what it means to be a, a servant, to be a child of the living King. In our text before us, our Lord Himself outlines some realizations, some, some things that every one of us should recognize. Note that these realizations are somewhat different from the ideas that we hear from a lot of preachers and a lot of, of so-called evangelists. And those who basically preach a gospel of prosperity. Those who promise you blessings and peace and prosperity if you'll only commit to sending X number of dollars a month 
their ministry. And we should not fool ourselves into thinking that because we're tithers or generous givers, that that is going to equate with prosperity in the physical world. I'm not saying that we shouldn't support worthy causes. I'm not saying that all evangelists are sleazy by any means. What I am saying is that the gospel that's presented on the pages of our Bible differs a great deal from that which is preached in many pulpits today. We would be quite naive if we didn't know that there was a definite cost to being a disciple, to serving the Lord. And let's see what, what Jesus defined as some of those costs. First of all, there's no guarantee of safety. No guarantee of safety. In verses 57 and 58, someone said, Lord, I'll follow you anywhere. And the Lord replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus said, you know, a father takes care of wildlife. But it costs us humans something to be his children. And for Jesus, he was saying, I'm basically homeless. I'm basically homeless. We cannot call into question the sincerity of the man who made this statement to our Lord. In all likelihood, he, he really intended to follow Jesus. He really intended to go anywhere Jesus went. But the Lord reminded him that the desire to follow wouldn't erase difficulties that lay ahead for the true child of God. There would indeed be difficult times in which the safety of Christ's followers would become an issue. There would be times when there would be no one to invite him into a place of rest. Simply because he was following the Lord Jesus. The fact today is that there's no guarantee of safety for those of us who choose to live for Jesus. We have missionaries who report in some places around the world of a great openness to the gospel message unlike they've ever seen before. But there are also many cases of brutality and even murder against those who dare to be called Christians. Those numbers are on a steady rise. We really don't know how fortunate we are to live in a country where we can still freely worship and serve without the fear of being put to death. We don't really know just how many Christians in our world today face death daily. The possibility, the real possibility of death just for the simple fact they serve the Lord Jesus. They worship Him. They call on His name. And they, they go to great, great risk gather together like we're allowed to do here today. We're fortunate. We are blessed. But even here in America, there's no guarantee of our safety. We have to realize that, that following Jesus is risky business. We hear about events, tragic events happening all over our country as well, in which Christians and churches are targeted 
by those who would do harm. There's no guarantee of our safety. What's more, there's no guarantee of earthly riches. In these same verses, the implication is that there's no promise that we will be wealthy, that we will be healthy, Jesus said, you know, it's going to be hard to find a place to lay your head sometimes to follow me. I've heard of preachers who tell their congregation that if they'll meet certain criteria, such as giving enough money, attending, attending enough services, helping in particular ministries, they'll be taken care of for the rest of their lives. The Bible doesn't teach that kind of prosperity gospel. Not there. The Bible does teach. God will take care of our needs. He'll meet our needs. The Bible doesn't teach us that the amount of wealth we will receive will be related to the amount of faith we have. It's not biblical. If anything, it almost teaches the opposite. Remember, it was Jesus who first talked about how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. We're not promised earthly riches for serving the Lord. So we know there's a cost involved. There's no guarantee of our safety. There's no earthly riches. But Jesus also made it clear that there was another cost here. And that cost is that there will be no comfort or convenience. If being in danger, if being poor were not enough to encourage you to live for Jesus, Take into consideration that if we serve the Lord, we might not have a place to lay our heads. Not only is that devoid of safety and earthly riches, it's downright uncomfortable and very inconvenient. A number of years ago, there was a preacher that made this statement. I'm sorry, it wasn't a preacher, it was a, a song. The song said, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. The Lord Jesus has not promised us a life of safety and wealth, comfort and convenience. And many people fall for the prosperity gospel that, that promises safety and comfort, convenience and wealth. And they fall for it because it's pleasant. It's easy to accept. Who wouldn't want to have these things? The benefits of those of us who, who have what we need are wonderful. We can all feel better about what we have when we justify it by, by thinking that we deserve it. After all, we're good people. God's just blessing us for being so good. On the other hand, how do we explain the Mother Teresas of this world? How do we use that kind of reasoning to explain the thousands of missionaries who serve all over the world and face death every day because of their faith? We can't explain these things based on that kind of flawed gospel. The only service that our Lord knew when he walked the earth was service to God. And that never included his personal safety. 
earthly riches, or even his personal comfort and convenience. There's a final cost involved in following Jesus. And it's the cost we must seriously consider. It's one that you and I are faced with every day. We have a choice to make. Worldly priorities have to become secondary. If we're to follow Jesus, worldly priorities must become secondary. Going back to our text, verses 59 and following. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Here we have our Lord speaking what what sounds like pretty harsh words. Kind of uncompassionate, really. Words to, to people who, who may have had a sincere desire to follow him. You know, people today, many say, of course, I believe in God. Of course, I believe Jesus is his son. Sure, I want to be a Christian. I want to follow Jesus. But... But I have some other priorities that are keeping me from doing that just now. Well, I'm a believer, but I have these responsibilities right now. They keep me from being with God's people. They keep me from serving the world in the name of Jesus. We need to take a closer look to what Jesus was actually saying. Notice that his command was to follow him. Very simple. Follow me. And these men both, they they didn't say, well, I I really don't want to follow you. The first one and the last one, the third one, they each said, Lord, I will follow you. But the second one Jesus called to follow him, and he didn't say no. He just said, Lord, first I got something I need to take care of. They wanted to follow Jesus, but they wanted to delay that following. And a lot of people today say, well, I'm going to get involved in church. I'm going to go on a mission trip. I'm going to begin witnessing. I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to live for Jesus later. First, I've got to take care of some other things. First, I've got to concentrate on these priorities. When we stand before Jesus, what will those priorities mean to us then? When we stand before him, what will those things mean? What's going to matter? Only our service to him, our faith in him, and how obedient we were to him. So they weren't Rejecting Jesus, they were just delaying their service. And they actually had some pretty important things they needed to do. This is exactly the reaction many people have to Jesus in their lives. They know they need him. They may even want to follow him. But first of all, there are some matters they need to take care of. 
there are some loose ends to tie up. Unfortunately, even the most noble of causes, and Luke uses examples, pretty good ones. First, there's a man who wants to bury his father. There's a man who wants to go back home and say goodbye to his family. Luke uses those examples of people who are not actually rejecting Jesus. They're just making excuses for delaying following him. Sadly, there are many people today who will tell you that they have rejected Jesus so many times they'll never be saved. They, they don't believe the Spirit will, will ever convict them again of their need. We know what happens when these people die. They'll spend, spend eternity in hell. So don't allow yourself to become one of these people. Worldly priorities must become secondary. If we're to be godly men and women, godly young people, we have to put him first. That means ahead of family, career, home, possessions, bank account, popularity, you name it. It has to become a secondary priority if we're to be godly people. Before you start worrying about the harsh words Jesus spoke to this second man in our text, realize that the Bible doesn't even tell us that his father was dead. See, according to many of the Jewish sects, a young man was responsible. It was his solemn duty to bury his parents. And that means that he could not travel far away from home at any point in his lifetime until his parents were buried. So this man may have been putting off the Lord for a very long time. We don't know that his father was dead. The Bible doesn't say that. He may have been dying. He may have been dead. We just don't know. The point that Jesus is trying to get across here is that there's no duty more important than following Jesus. I can't think of one dead person, Christian or not, who would suggest that there's anything more important than knowing Jesus and having a relationship with Him and following Him. Understand that following Jesus, being His disciple, is not synonymous with religion, it's not about being religious. It's not the same thing as attending church or even being a devout student of the Bible. It can be all those things without following Jesus on a daily basis, on a practical level. Jesus emphasizes this in the final verse in this chapter, verse 62, but Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. When he take, talks about putting a hand to the plow, not looking back, the agricultural term he used here is indicative of a person who is plowing a straight line. If you take your eyes off of whatever that, that, that object is in the distance that you're focused on in order to plow a straight line, and you look back, you're going to get off course. You're no longer going to be plowing a straight line. And what this means to us is that we must move forward in our relationship with Jesus. We must never look back to the things of our old life. 
before we became true followers of Jesus. This passage is a challenge. It's a challenge for not just for these three men that we read about. It's a challenge for you and me today. For all of us who, who desire to live godly lives day in and day out. A challenge for us to walk upright before the Lord. To be examples of godly living. We must lead our families. Work our jobs. Share our faith with those around us. With Christ as our focal point. Christian worldview, if you will. Christianity is not merely a belief. It's a relationship with Jesus that leads us to follow him, to be obedient, to serve. In our text, the Lord gives us three examples, three different kinds of people who would follow him, who wanted to follow him. Or at least said they did. One was impulsive. Just blurted out. Lord, I'll follow you anywhere you want to go. I'm there. I'm your man. But. But. One of them had a sense of conflicting duties. Y yeah, I'll follow. But first, I need to, need to take care of a responsibility I have. The other had divided loyalty. Well, yeah, I want to follow you, but I also have family. I need to go back and, and see them. Say goodbye. All three of these men had good intentions. But they had the wrong attitude. They had the wrong understanding about the kingdom of God. I'm not telling you to desert your family. But I'm telling you, you must Count the cost of being a disciple. Salvation is free, but discipleship is costly. Salvation costs the Lord his life. For you and me, it is free. But following Jesus is very costly. It may cost us our safety. It may cost us earthly riches. It may cost us comfort and convenience. And it cost us the right to, to set our own priorities. We have to make him first. Salvation is free. True discipleship is costly. Think about what a small price really you and I have to pay compared to the price that Jesus paid for our salvation. Jesus wants us to give him our all. Second best is not good enough. If God had settled for second best, we would be doomed. If God had said, you know, I, I, I know I need to send a sacrifice, I've got the perfect sacrifice right here, my son, my only son, but he's my only son. I'll send the next best thing. Wouldn't have been enough. Wouldn't have been enough to pay the price for our sins. It was only Christ, sinless. Only Christ was perfect. Only he was good enough to pay the price. Holy enough to pay the price. The perfect Lamb of God. He doesn't settle for second best. Jesus gave his all for us. What he went through on that cross was for you and me. What have we given him? Do we give him our best? Do we choose every day to give him the best we have? 
Does he get the leftovers of our time? Does he get the leftovers of, of our talents? Does he get the leftovers of, of our giving? Does he get the leftovers of even consideration? After we've done those things that we enjoy doing in the world, then, oh yeah, I can do this good deed for the Lord. may not think that you have much to offer. Maybe your life isn't what it should be. Maybe you don't feel worthy of his love. Truth is, none of us are worthy. That's where grace comes in. None of us are worthy of his love, but because of his great love for us, there's grace. You can stand before God clean, pure, holy. You can be forgiven and cleansed if you will just let Jesus have his way in your life. This can happen today. Remember, discipleship is costly. To be a true disciple We must be willing to give our all. Everything. Understand that you don't have time to go get yourself cleaned up first and then follow Jesus. No. Don't worry about those kind of loose ends. Surrender to Jesus. He'll take the the time to clean you up. He'll make you what you want to be if you are completely yielded to him. We'll take care of the sin. It's only Jesus who can save us. But you and I, we must be willing participants. You can become a godly man or woman starting today by just coming to Him. By saying, yes, Lord, I'll follow you, period. No buts, period. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Being a true disciple does not ensure your safety. It does not ensure riches, comfort, convenience, or the Christian worldly priorities must become secondary. Are you ready to pay these costs in light of the high price that Jesus paid for your sins? You can know Him today. You can have a relationship with Him. And you will know joy. I can't promise you safety, riches, comfort, convenience. I can promise you joy if you make His priorities first. Joy doesn't always mean happiness. Remember that. Joy in the Lord. And in eternity beyond anything we can imagine. Heavenly Father, as your Holy Spirit continues to speak to us, Lord, I just pray that you would remove any barriers in our minds that would would keep us from, from stepping out and making a decision to follow you. That we all might be joined together around your throne someday. For those of us who know you, but have allowed the the cares of this world to creep into our lives and take priority, help us, Lord, to make things right. Father, we will praise you for all that you do. This time, commitment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.